After ruling the country for more than 40 years, Philip II died in 1598 and was followed on the throne by his 20-year-old son, Philip III. The old king had his doubts about the ability of his son to take the mantle of ruling, and unfortunately for his kingdoms, his judgement was to be proven right. Unlike his father or grandfather, who took a very active part in governing their realms, Philip III was mostly content, allowing his subordinates to rule, and his friend and mentor, the Duke of Lerma, became the Valido, aka favorite, the unofficial prime minister of the king. From this moment on, the Spanish Habsburg king heavily relied on their Validos, and a dual power structure developed. Unfortunately for the Spanish Empire, Lerma was not much more capable than the king and attended government business irregularly. During the first decade of Philip III's reign, peace was re-established with England in 1604 and with the Dutch Republic in 1609. Though in this latter case, the precarious finances of the Habsburgs played their part, as they were forced to declare bankruptcy again in 1607. To save face for the failure of the Low Countries, Philip III and his ministers ordered the expulsion of the Morisco population of the Iberian Peninsula. Estimates vary about the total number of people who were expelled, though the number was likely not more than 300,000, which was less than 5% of the total population of the peninsula. Still, the expulsion hit hard the Kingdom of Aragon, especially in Valencia, where the Moriscos made up a much higher percentage of the population. By the last years of Philip III's reign, the structural weaknesses of the Spanish Habsburg monarchy were very apparent, expressing themselves in the deep population of Castile and the struggle of the Habsburg kings to raise sufficient revenue to finance their ambitious foreign policy. Historian John Eliot believed that the problems were already present during the reign of Charles V, namely the inability of the Spanish Habsburgs to efficiently tax the wealth of their numerous kingdoms besides Castile. The emperor famously said, I cannot be sustained except by my kingdoms of Spain. And the situation was not rose-colored in Castile either. First of all, foreign bankers came to dominate the country's sources of wealth. Secondly, the emperor's reign determined that Castile would bear the main weight of the fiscal burden within Spain. In the third place, it ensured that within Castile, the brunt of the burden was borne by those classes which were least capable of bearing it. Thanks to their inability to raise sufficient money through taxes, the Habsburgs had to rely on financiers from Germany, the Low Countries and Italy. These latter became dominant from the reign of Philip II onwards, who lent them money at extortionate interest rates. Many people came to the forefront with ideas to reform the monarchy, but no reforms were put through during the reign of Philip III. The reforms had to wait until he died in 1621. When Philip IV took the throne, he was only a boy aged 16, and it was little surprise that he was heavily reliant on his advisors. Just like during his father's reign, a valido emerged during the reign of Philip IV. The first valido of Philip IV was Gaspar de Guzman, better known as Count Duke Olivares. Unlike the rather passive Duke of Lerma, Olivares was a workaholic that rivaled even Philip II. He was also convinced that reforms had to be pushed through for the Habsburgs to maintain their place as a dominant dynasty of Europe, and for the next two decades he worked tirelessly to make these reforms happen. Still, the political situation of Europe did not allow Olivares to force through his reforms in a time of peace and tranquility, as the Duke of Lerma could have done so had he had the will to do so. By the time Philip III died in 1619, the truce against the Dutch became very unpopular among the ministers of the king, and it came as little surprise that it was not renewed upon its expiration. Thus, the war against the Dutch Republic was resumed in 1621. Modern historians believe that Olivares no longer believed that a reconquest of the Republic was feasible, as the Dutch had grown immensely wealthy, but by defeating them and harassing their commerce, he hoped to force them to come to an accommodation that was more favorable to the Habsburgs in the truce of 1609. Once the conflict was resumed, the Habsburgs pursued a double land and naval strategy. The land armies were led by the formidable general Ambrogio Spinola, while the naval warfare was primarily waged through privateers, who used Dunkirk as their base and preyed upon Dutch shipping. Peninsular ports were also closed to Dutch shipping, Though, as always in early modern Europe, the corruption of officials often sabotaged royal policies. Besides reopening the conflict with the Dutch, the Spanish Habsburgs also assisted their Austrian cousins in the Thirty Years' War. Before the reopening of the conflict with the Dutch, Spinola led his men into the Palatinate, 
and great sums were also sent to bolster the finances of Emperor Ferdinand II. Despite being deeply embroiled in military conflicts, Olivares was also eager to push through his reforms, hoping these would enable him to streamline the finances of the empire, create a common defense force, and revive its economy. One of Olivares' most ambitious plans was a project called Union of Arms, according to which the different kingdoms of Philip's empire would have contributed proportionally to the common defense of the monarchy. According to Olivares' proposal, Castile would have financed 44,000 soldiers, Aragon 32,000, the Spanish Netherlands 12,000, Naples 16,000, Sicily 6,000, Portugal 16,000, Milan 6,000, and the Atlantic and Mediterranean islands another 6,000. In total, this would have meant that the different kingdoms would have contributed to the recruitment and maintenance of a standing force of 140,000 soldiers, a very high number for the time. Unfortunately for Olivares, this proposal was not received enthusiastically, especially in Aragon, whose elites believed their burden compared to their means was not in balance. Though the Aragonese always dragged their feet, their objections to Olivares' scheme were more than fair as, even though the Kingdom of Aragon was in reality made up of three entities, even in demographic and economic decline, Castile still easily dwarfed its smaller neighbors multiple times over. Furthermore, they saw Olivares' reformist agenda as a threat to their rights and liberties, which were guaranteed by their constitutions. The Valido had more success in Italy, and especially Naples contributed greatly to the expanses of the monarchy in the first half of the 17th century. Olivares' other projects did not fare much better either, and the local parliaments rejected his tax reforms, leaving Olivares no option but to use increasingly more desperate measures to keep state finances afloat as the war progressed. Among these desperate measures included appropriating the silver of private individuals from the treasure fleets, which would then be converted into state bonds, selling land and titles to private individuals, and even reviving the feudal obligations of nobles to raise and arm soldiers to the royal army from their own pockets. Still, despite all the struggles the Valido had in reforming his king's empire, up until 1628 the Habsburgs, both the Spanish and Austrian branches, appeared successful. But things began to change for the worse during this fateful year. Following yet another bankruptcy in 1627, the finances of Madrid were already reeling when disaster struck and the Dutch captured half of the all-important convoy that carried the silver of the Americas to Spain. Olivares had also made a huge blunder in 1628 when he entered the Mantuan War of Succession. Spinola and part of his army were diverted to northern Italy, giving the Dutch a much-needed breather. Worse than the simple entry to the conflict was its outcome, as the Habsburgs failed to achieve victory and the French candidate took the throne of the small but strategically important Italian state. The veteran Spinola also died during the conflict, robbing Spain of her greatest general. Between 1628 and 1633, the situation in the Low Countries steadily deteriorated. The Austrian Habsburgs also suffered numerous reverses in the same period, when the Swedes led by Gustavus Adolphus intervened in the Thirty Years' War. Things briefly turned for the better in 1634, when a joint Spanish imperial force smashed the Protestants at the Battle of Nordlingen. Led by the younger brother of Philip IV, the Cardinal Infant, the reinforced army of Flanders stabilized the situation in the Low Countries. Nonetheless, arguably, the Habsburg victory caused more trouble than good. The defeat of the Swedes and Protestant Germans at Nordlingen finally forced Richelieu to bring France into the war directly. Up to that point, Richelieu only financed the enemies of the Habsburgs and entered proxy conflicts. But the Habsburg triumph at Nordlingen forced his hand. From that moment on, the Spanish Netherlands came under attack from two sides, but the veteran army of Flanders initially held its own. Nonetheless, the Spanish Habsburgs started to suffer ever more frequent defeats in the late 1630s and 1640s. Following French advances in the Rhine region, the famous Spanish road, the land route through which the army of Flanders was resupplied, was severed, leaving the Spanish only the risky sea lane through the channel. At 1639, the Dutch destroyed a Spanish fleet carrying reinforcements at the Battle of Downs, while the Dutch also halted a joint Spanish-Portuguese force near Brazil a few months later at the Battle of Itamarca. A disillusioned Olivares was at his wit's end by then and could only explain the misfortune he and his king suffered as divine will. 
Worse than those reverses, internal revolts also rocked the Spanish monarchy. Catalonia revolted against the rule of Madrid in 1640, and the rebels quickly sought assistance from the French. The news of the Catalan revolt emboldened the Portuguese as well, who deposed the Habsburg officials in December 1640 and proclaimed the Duke of Braganza as their king. His inability to quell the revolt of Catalonia sealed Olivares' fate, who was dismissed from the court in January of 1642. A year after the fall of Olivares, his great rivals Richelieu and Louis XIII also died, but a Spanish offensive launched to capitalize while Paris was plagued by a power vacuum was crushed at the Battle of Roi Ever since then, Roi was traditionally seen as a symbolic battle, which signaled the waning of the Spanish power and the rise of France. True enough, the Spanish were forced into the defensive after Roi but the war against France was to last for another 16 years. Following Roi the Dutch also began to fear the French more than the Spanish, and sought to make peace to keep the Spanish Netherlands as a useful buffer against the aggressive and expanding French kingdom. Negotiations lasted a while, but the two sides made peace in 1648, ending their conflict that had originally begun in 1568. The Spanish finally recognized the independence of the Dutch, who also received trade concessions in the Spanish Empire. The war against the French continued for another 11 years. Thanks to the outbreak of revolts in France, the Spanish received an opportunity to regain some lost ground between 1648 and 1652. Unfortunately for Philip IV, his empire was no longer in any state to deliver a knockout blow against the French. Once Cardinal Mazarin placated the majority of the rebels, the opportunity for the Spanish was gone. In 1655, the French were also joined by the English, who decisively tilted the balance in their favor. A defeated Spain was finally forced to make peace with their French enemies in 1659. The Treaty of the Pyrenees was quite mild, and the Habsburgs lost only minor territories, but historians still saw it as a watermark moment of European history, one that saw the eclipse of Habsburg Spain by France as the strongest entity in Europe. Once peace was re-established with the French, the Spanish were finally able to concentrate against the rebellions. Luckily for Madrid, by 1659, the Catalans were pacified, so they could concentrate their effort against the Portuguese. But by this time, Castile was well and truly exhausted, and the English also sent soldiers to assist the Portuguese. With the country badly depopulated and the silver coming from America dwindling, the ill-equipped forces sent against the Portuguese were defeated, and Portuguese independence was officially recognized in 1668. Philip IV did not live long enough to see the independence of Portugal, and died shortly after his forces suffered a heavy defeat at the Battle of Montes Claros in 1665. When Philip IV died, he was followed on the throne by his four-year-old son, Charles II. Charles' parents were uncle and niece, and the unfortunate fruit of this incestuous marriage bore all the negative consequences of Habsburg inbreeding. Almost constantly ill, most of Europe expected Charles to die at any moment, only for him to baffle them by surviving until the ripe old age of 39. As Charles was only a boy upon his ascension, Regents ruled in his name, leading to a power struggle between Charles's mother and his illegitimate half-brother, Don Juan José. Don Juan was a seasoned commander, a veteran of both Flanders and Portugal, and he was also very popular in both Castile and Aragon. At first, he was content with becoming the Viceroy of Aragon, but in 1677 he moved against Madrid and seized power. Despite the great hopes many put in him, the tenure of Don Juan at the helm of Castile was short-lived, and he died only two years later. While internally the monarchy was unstable due to the infighting, in terms of foreign policy, the Habsburgs also suffered further reverses. Both in the 1660s, 1670s and 1680s, they came under attack from the French, who conquered parts of the Spanish Netherlands and the entire French Comte. By this time, it was painfully obvious that the Spanish Habsburgs were no longer able to match the French on their own, but luckily for them, everyone else was in the same boat. Unable to hold their own against Louis XIV, the Spanish Habsburgs 
the Dutch, the British and the Holy Roman Emperor formed a coalition that fought the French to a standstill in the Nine Years' War. Had Charles been able to sire a male heir, his dynasty probably could have gone on for quite a while, with territories largely intact. As though no doubt France under Louis XIV was bestially strong, not even Louis himself was capable to defeat such a strong coalition. Unfortunately for his dynasty, Charles II was simply incapable of siring a male heir. The centuries-long habit of Habsburg inbreeding had finally caught up with the family, and the line became extinct with the death of Charles in November of 1700, signaling the end of Habsburg rule in the Iberian Peninsula. Two candidates emerged to succeed Charles, Philip of France, the grandson of Louis XIV, and Prince Charles of Austria, the younger son of Emperor Leopold, who also received the backing of the British and the Dutch. Charles nominated Philip as the heir to the whole Spanish Habsburg patrimony, leaving Europe on the brink of a large-scale conflict. In the lead-up to Charles' death, Louis XIV and his rivals made several agreements about the partitioning of the Spanish Empire. However, Charles's will offered much more than any of the agreements he made with William of Orange and Emperor Leopold, and after some hesitation, he accepted the Spanish inheritance on the behalf of his grandson. The Bourbon succession to a unified Spanish Empire was unacceptable to the English, Dutch and Austrian Habsburgs, leading to the outbreak of the War of the Spanish Succession. The war lasted until 1713, when the exhausted warring sides finally made peace. According to their agreement, Philip became the King of Spain, and the Iberian Kingdom was allowed to keep her large American Empire. But the Spanish Netherlands and the Italian provinces went to the Austrian branch of the family. The dying out of the Spanish branch and the inability of the Austrian branch to secure the Spanish patrimony left the Habsburg dynasty much weakened. Nonetheless, the Austrian branch of the family still remained a formidable power on the continent and remained one of the great powers of Europe for the next two centuries. A disillusioned Olivares what has A disillusioned Olivares was at its A disillusioned Olivares was at its <laughs> A disillusioned Olivares was at its it <laughs> A disillusioned Olivares was at his A disillusioned Olivares was at his <laughs> This is difficult to say. 